All right, I can see that our webinar participants are starting to roll in, so I'll give them about another minute and then I will introduce everyone for the day. All right. Well, hello everyone and good morning or good afternoon, depending where you're joining us from today. And welcome to the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network's last webinar of 2021. So our past few webinars, we've focused on various grapevine diseases. However, today we're going to be switching gears a bit and talking about grapevine rootstocks. So my name is Darian Temporal and I'm the project manager of CGCN. I also sit on CGCN's Knowledge and Technology Transfer Committee or KTT committee, along with Ross Wise, which is uh, CGCN's board director and Bill Armstrong, also CGCN's board director. Give you a little bit of background on myself. I was born and raised right here in the Niagara region. I graduated from Brock University with an honors bachelor of business administration in 2020. And I will be continuing my studies at McMaster University to to complete my master's of business administration. My passion for the grape and wine industry started about two years ago when I was hired as the marketing summer student with the Grape Growers of Ontario and it's snowballed ever since. The first webinar in this four-part series was on grapevine red blotch, second was on grapevine leaf roll, and third was on grapevine trunk diseases. You can find the recording to these webinars on CGCN's website under news and webinars heading at cgcn-rccv.ca. Today's webinar is on grapevine rootstocks and is structured a bit different from our others. Today, we will welcome two guests to present about grapevine rootstocks, one from a Canadian perspective and one from the American perspective. And then we will move the webinar to a panel discussion moderated by CGCN's Ross Wise and welcome two additional guests to join our panel. So joining us today, we have Dr. Jim Woolworth, Dr. Andrew Walker, Mike Watson, and CGCN's Vice Chair, Bill Schenk. Now, before I introduce our first speaker of the day, I would like to mention that we encourage our audience members to ask questions for the panel discussion. So please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen to ask your questions. When it is time for the discussion, I will be moderating questions along with Ross. If you know anyone that wasn't able to attend today's session, this webinar will be posted on CGCN's website shortly. I will also be sending a webinar follow-up survey and I would greatly appreciate it if you would take one minute to fill this out when you receive it. This helps CGCN plan for future events and sessions. Now, without further ado, Dr. Jim Woolworth is an assistant professor in grapevine physiology in the Department of Biological Sciences and a researcher at the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute at Brock University. The major component of his research program is focused on grapevine cold hardiness physiology and understanding how to maximize cold hardiness and vitivinifera. In addition, he has research projects involving grapevine clone and rootstock evaluations, novel freeze and crop protection strategies, and viticultural practices to improve sparkling and still wine production. Dr. Wilworth strives to provide effective technology transfer to the grape grower community across Canada to improve grape production and quality across the sector. He works very closely with industry on their priorities and provides knowledge transfer through workshops, seminars, and research demonstrations. And now we welcome Jim Woolworth for his presentation. Thank you very much, Darian, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation today uh, from, from CGCN. And uh, I really appreciate uh, being here today to speak. Um, it's real. It's a real honor also to be on a rootstock discussion with uh, Dr. Andy Walker for, from California as well. I mean, he's someone I certainly have looked up to over the years, and and he is a true rootstock expert. Uh, I I am dabbling in some rootstock research, research and evaluations and so on, but he is the true uh, one of the true experts with rootstock. So it's it's humbling to be even on the same stage with him. So I just want to say that to start. So today I want to give a, a bit of an update on some research that we're doing with with rootstocks and some of our evaluations, what we're up to, 
and working closely with CGCN and Agriculture, Agriculture Agri-Food Canada. Uh, and then also just talk about rootstocks in general here in Canada. So I wanna just give a, brief, a very brief background on rootstocks and their benefits. Uh, what are some of the criteria we look for here in Canada with respect to our rootstock selection? Uh, some of the ongoing rootstock trials here in Ontario. Uh, talk a little bit about some of the work that just getting started with some of our clone and rootstock evaluations, uh, as well as some, uh, some published work that we've, we've done with uh, looking at cold hardiness with respect to clone and rootstock combinations. Uh, we're seeing a lot of really extreme weather worldwide. So I just want to touch base a bit on climate change uh, and rootstock considerations, and then also talk about CGCN's role in the need for a domestic rootstock production here in Canada itself. So when we talk about grapevine material, and, and we always want to match it to the environment, right? And the selection of plant material is an important resource for climate adaptation. And it's really important just in general with, with when you're planting a vineyard, right? You want to be matching uh, the, the appropriate uh, genetic material to the location. So this can include, I mean, we, we look at our native species where they do best. Uh, and, and the same thing applies to a lot of our rootstock material as well. But we want to look at different species or crosses of different species. Uh, the cultivar makes a difference. And then we're looking more at clone. Today we're talking about rootstock. And finally, quality material is essential. And that's one thing I did learn from Andy over the years was, you know, looking at problems that were happening in California and the whole business of having clean material coming from our nurseries uh, and supplying clean material to the industry and how roles that, uh, that institutions can play, researchers can play, and organizations like CGCN can play when it comes to uh, quality uh, plant material. And I'll talk to that at the end of the presentation. But generally, when you're talking about a rootstock, what is it? Uh, it's a specialized stock material to which the grapevine cultivar, which is the scion, uh, with desirable fruit characteristics are grafted. And when you talk about the shoot portion, so the above ground uh, portion of the vine, it's the scion. In the lower portion, the root portion, the rootstock, is providing the root system to the fused combination of those different genotypes. And when we talk about our rootstocks, most of them have a high proportion of North American uh, uh, material in their genetic background. So for us in Ontario and in, in, in Canada in, uh, in general, uh, we have a lot of, we use a lot of rootstock that have uh, Vitis riparia, Vitis rupestris, uh, Vitis balanderi, for example. Uh, if you want to look at specific rootstocks that a lot of people are familiar with, you know, for example, um, um, 3309 is a riparia rupestris cross, SO4 is, is riparia uh, balandieri. And, and so we use a lot of these, uh, these rootstocks that have that strong uh, North American uh, parentage. If you look at the genetic, or sorry, the grafted grapevine, uh, this is just an example of an omega graft. And you can see here at the top, we have the scion portion and then the rootstock portion, and they're connected through this graft. So when we talk about transmitting viruses, for example, and when I talk later in the presentation, you know, if, if the rootstock material is, is dirty or has an, it has a uh, virus infection, it will transmit to the scion and throughout the whole vine and vice versa. So it's important that both these pieces are clean. And I know all of you have been listening to the other CGCN seminars with, uh, uh, concerning the viruses, so you are familiar with with how they're they're spread. So when it comes to rootstocks, they they do uh, strongly interact with the scion genotypes, and what happens is we it modifies the whole plant development, biomass accumulation and partitioning, so where the energy is distributed through the vine, and depending on uh, on the rootstock, it can also impact phenology, uh, you know, in terms of uh, in terms of the vine growth, and. Andy's gonna talk a lot about this in his presentation, but rootstock breeding programs have aimed to improve pest resistance and adaptation to different abiotic stresses as well. So why do we use rootstock in Canada? In, in essence, in a, lot of our in a lot of our grape growing regions, we don't have a choice, we have to. And a lot of this has to do with the pest uh, phylloxera, which is endemic in our, in our soils, in our, in, our, in our grape growing regions. And so we need resistance to that pest also to nematode resistance, and also some adaptability reasons for uh, tolerance to different soils, uh, high, whether it's high lime soils, high pH soils, uh, salty saline soils, uh, wetter soils. Uh, there's a lot of rootstocks that aren't really 
uh, totally tolerant to wet feet. Grapes don't like wet feet, but some rootstocks are better with dealing with wetter soils and also drought, which is becoming more prominent, especially in areas like uh, British Columbia. And overall, we have like over 80% of the world's vineyards are using rootstock. So there's, there's a lot of benefits. Even if you're not in a phylloxera zone, there can be still uh, a lot of benefits to using a rootstock. And that's why we see a lot of our interspecific hybrids that are even um, grafted to, to rootstock, even though they might have some tolerance to some of these pests. So we have resistance to some of the, the biotic pests, uh, tolerance, uh, whether it's lime, salinity, or water stress, but it's all could be really beneficial for growth. You know, could, could it help control your growth, especially if you're in a vigorous site? Uh, a less vigorous rootstock could be advantageous. You might want to shorten the, the vegetative cycle. And rootstocks can also impact the uptake of nutrients. Uh, the, 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 in an example of just the looking at growth, I mean, you could see in the, in the picture there on the right, this is from a, a study in, in New York State. And in the middle there is, is Cabernet Sauvignon uh, grafted to uh, Riparid Gloire. And on, the, on either side is, is grafted to 3309. And you could just look at the vines and see some of the differences with respect to the vigor. But in Canada, a lot of our rootstock uh, choices are due to um, our, our climate, right? And one of the, the biggest things is our harsh winter climate and also our relative short growing season. And we also need to have them uh, resistant to phylloxera, nematodes, and also be adaptive to a wide range of soil conditions. I mean, we're growing grapes on sandy soils, clay soils, uh, different types of uh, uh, pH in our soils, and also water availability, right? We have uh, very uh, variable growing seasons. Uh, we have some regions where we, we are irrigating our vines all the time, such as in uh, areas of British Columbia. And then we have areas like Ontario, uh, where we are seeing uh, some seasons with persistent drought and other seasons where we have a lot of moisture. So they have to be quite adaptable. And the, region I, the reason I showed you this picture here on the right is just to show you, you know, uh, how a hardy rootstock uh, it, it could be really beneficial with respect to uh, getting vines through cold winters. So you could see that the vine was hurt by a cold winter, but the rootstock survived. And then we, we saw, we see lots of growth uh, from the scion with all those suckers uh, a year or so later. So I've mentioned a little bit already in terms of our rootstock selection in Canada, we have a lot of diverse growing regions with different soil types, and we can have a large variation in our vintages. You know, if it's, it's easier to, to have a, uh, to grow grapes in, in regions where it's, it's consistent through, through the year and through the, uh, and, and through the different vintages, but we don't have that luxury, it seems, in Canada. We can have seasons with wet growing seasons. We can have uh, air, times of drought. Uh, we can have periods of uh, short drought and then really wet conditions and in those types of uh, um, scenarios. So we need to have rootstocks with a different degree of, different, of resistance to drought, whether it's wet feet or, or cold temperatures as well. And there's also production goals too. You know, some, it, depending on what you're growing, the cultivar, uh, their site, uh, and, and what the end product of the grapes are going to be, you might want to use a different rootstock as well. You know, so if you're growing Pinot Noir and you want uh, really small uh, vines, small yields, you might use a different rootstock than you would if you're uh, growing, let's say in here in Ontario, uh, plateau priced uh, uh, grapes. So you can't just say there's one rootstock that's, that's the, you know, that's the best uh, because we, we do have a lot of different conditions that we're growing the grapes in. For, but these are some of the common rootstocks that we do use. These are the workhorses, I would say for, for most of our industry, uh, for sure here in Ontario and on the East Coast, these are for, uh, the most prominent ones. I'll let Mike uh, in the panel weigh in a bit about what they're using currently in BC and the workhorses there, uh, and, and also what new ones we might be seeing coming out of the uh, British Columbia growing regions. But on the East Coast, these are certainly the, some of the ones that we're using the most. Um, and when I looked at the last uh, 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 BC wine grape growers uh, guide, they were, there was, a lot of these were mentioned as well. So you look at the parentage, we're looking at, again, a lot of riparia, uh, riparia rupestris crosses uh, in riparia balandieri. Um, crosses as well. You can see there's a lot of high phylloxera tolerance, uh, nematode resistance, um, and you look at the soil types. We're looking at a lot more moist soils, uh, fertile, uh, deep type soils, uh, not like not dry soils here that you would see like in California where they're using uh, much more drought tolerant rootstocks, uh, such as some of like uh, 
some of the Richter rootstocks or others. And you can also see here that just some of the influence on the scion as well with respect to vigor. And a lot of this has to do again with its parentage. But one thing that we are dealing with in Canada and we have to think about moving forward is climate change. It is a reality. Uh, look at what we're seeing currently in, in British Columbia and what we have seen over the past month with this heat dome. We keep seeing these scenarios, right? Polar vortex, heat domes. These are climate, a lot of these are climate change related. Uh, I really feel for all of our colleagues and friends in Germany who are dealing with the flooding. You know, these are, these are real life scenarios that are happening right now. And, and a lot of them, when you listen to the climatologists, they're saying these aren't normal trends. These are climate change related. So we might be seeing more uh, average temperature rises, more heat waves, you know, more of this heat dome, higher drought incidents. You know, I talked or I, I messaged with my uh, colleague or a lot of our friends here, uh, uh, Dr. Pat Bowen, and she said that they haven't had a decent rain since February in, in, in BC. You know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's disturbing really. Um, you know, when we also see more extreme events, and we all know that when you farm and grape growing is farming, that we do farm the extremes. And so we have to look at these scenarios when we're looking at our plant selection and specifically our rootstocks. So rootstocks can really help improve the sustainability of a wine region. Uh, there's more and more of a need for us to be doing studies and regional studies uh, with rootstocks because grower, as a grower, you don't wanna be experimenting with some of these rootstocks and planting entire fields uh, and especially from some of the trials that we've been doing, you know, if they, if the vines fail, they fail sometimes right away. So we, we are building our industry on core varieties. And, and so instead of replacing entire vineyards with new scion material, it's, it's very advantageous to possibly be using uh, new rootstock material, better rootstock material. You know, for example, if, if it's going to become more and more, um, uh, more, we're going to see more drought conditions in areas like British Columbia or in Ontario. You know, maybe we want to start looking at more drought tolerant rootstocks, you know, get away from, uh, you know, Ripera Gloire or, or other rootstocks like that, for example. And there is a, a, a really strong need for not only a domestic effort to look at rootstocks, but also an international effort. And this is where some of the work that, you know, Andy's been working on and so on uh, is, is to develop new rootstocks to deal with what we're going to be seeing in the future. And it can be both abiotics threats, you know, like the, um, like drought conditions or, or what have you, but it could also be new biotic threats uh, to our wine regions and the spread of that uh, through our different regions. And if you, if you listen to Han Schultz talk uh, the, uh, for the ASEV, um, I think it was the honorary lecture, um, you know, he mentioned about this, uh, this effort that's needed uh, specific, specifically with rootstock. So, you know, it's, it's, it's something that's really important. Here in Ontario, through the support of OGWRI, uh, NSERC, our national funding entity, as well as uh, CGCN and the AgriScience Grape Cluster, we have started to look at uh, some of our uh, core varieties uh, and look at specific clones and rootstocks for these, uh, uh, for these core uh, varieties for, uh, for Ontario and looking at different soil types as well. So we're just getting these into production. We're starting to collect more data on these. So over the years, you're going to see more and more uh, data on these, but we're looking at a number of different uh, varieties, uh, different clones of each, and looking at some of our uh, core rootstocks that we're using now, and also ex examining some other rootstocks that are newer uh, to our region. Uh, looking at different soil types, like I mentioned, and also examining uh, a number of different uh, parameters and such as, you know, looking at our vine performance, uh, yields, fruit composition. And we also want to look at the enological potential. So actually making uh, wines and having that vine to glass approach. One of the other things we've started to look at is, is looking at hardiness. And a lot of my research has been focusing on different cultivar hardiness and also looking at clones. But we've also been examining rootstock as well. And there's some work done in the, in the 80s uh, looking at different rootstock, and, um, and, and there was concluded that, uh, that's, that certain rootstocks, such as 3309, was some of the more cold tolerant, uh, and own rooted was the worst of all of them. But rootstocks can also have maybe an effect indirectly by, by uh, mitigating vigor, uh, vine balance, and so on. 
So we wanted to examine some of this. So, you know, what if the vines we planted were more cold tolerant, you know, looking at different clones within, within, uh, uh, within a variety, as well as looking at different rootstock. So I'll talk a bit about the rootstock work. Um, we looked at four different um, uh, Sauvignon Blanc uh, clones and different uh, Riesling clones that were all planted on different rootstock. I'll for this, we're looking at for this study. I'll talk about the Riesling clones, and this was uh, work done by our PhD student Andrea Andrian Haberache. We've also have other studies ongoing in Ontario, uh, which is some work we're doing right now with Cabernet Franc, a different clone on different rootstock, uh, some additional Riesling studies that we've done, and also some work that's being done by Dr. Helen Fisher and uh, Ali uh, Rami, who's in the picture there, uh, and this is looking at some really interesting uh, conditions for vineyards where it's, it's sandy, uh, very cold, uh, or it can be very cold winters and, uh, and very vigorous soils, uh, very uh, fertile sandy soils. And so in this study, they were looking at uh, different vinifera grafted to different rootstock. And also uh, they've collected a number of, of Vitus riparia ascensions. And that's what it's in the diagram there or in the photo there, I should say. And it's all of these different riparia uh, collected across from Ontario, uh, grafted to Pinot Noir. And, uh, and she presented some of this work at the uh, Eastern section uh, meeting that we just had uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and so there were some interesting differences with, with respect to some of the hardiness actually of these, uh, uh, of these rootstocks and their impact on the scions. So I just wanna acknowledge some of that work as well. So with respect to the work doing with the look that we were looking at with Riesling, uh, over the, over the a period of a three-year uh, time frame, uh, we looked at uh, Riesling 239 on these different rootstocks. And what we found was that we didn't find any differences with respect to crop load at all in, in vigor really. So the vines were considered imbalanced so that we weren't having uh, an issue with respect to you know, overly vigorous vines, undercrop vines or anything like that. But we did find an impact on, on hardiness in some, in some instances. Uh, and, and, in, and in some winters, you could see that uh, Vitus riparia on 239, let's say in 2016, 17, had, had uh, greater hardiness in, in some years uh, and at some periods of time. But one of the more interesting things that we found was that clones had a greater influence in rootstock, which we kind of expected and based on some of our anecdotal evidence from growers and from some of those polar vortex years, which we've seen. But the other interesting thing that we found was a lot of uh, uh, clone rootstock interactions. So that the, the, the clone, when it was grafted on a certain rootstock, had, better, had different performance. So for example, clone 49 seemed to do better on SO4 and 239 performed better on riparia gloire. And again, there was some of this yearly variation. So, you know, talking with growers, it's, it's, it's always interesting to see you know, what they're finding with saying, ah, you know what, this clone doesn't do all that well on this rootstock or, or that rootstock and so on. So it's really important. And we're finding this more and more. We found this with Cabernet Franc as well, that there are some really important clone rootstock interactions. So I don't think that could be ignored. So when we look at hardiness, you know, we want to look at, um, you know, clones, cultivars and the rootstocks, they will all impact uh, the hardiness. And the one but the one point that I want to make, though, is that the vine material, if it's matched to the site conditions, it'll be the most resilient if, if it's properly matched. And, um, and it should be noted that rootstock and clones should be taken into consideration when you're reporting the cultivar's hardiness, because it does seem to have an impact. The other thing we've found from some of our other studies where we've planted a lot of these new uh, rootstocks and um, that are not that common to our region is that after year one, we have found that some vines have completely died. And so a poor rootstock choice may have immediate impact on winter survival. And I, when, when I was listening to Dr. Fisher's presentation uh, the, other, the other week, she noticed the same thing, that there were some uh, combinations that did not do well. So it is something to note uh, and, and something to consider. Now, the one thing that is utmost important, and this is something, obviously, if, if you're supportive of CGCN, as you should be, uh, quality of material is really, really important. So it doesn't matter what rootstock you have or clone, if it's not clean, if it's not uh, true to type, 
you, you are going to be struggling right from the get-go and you can't make a reliable uh, um, decision on, on in terms of if that's a good choice or not, if it's, if it's uh, uh, disease from the get-go. So when it comes to rootstocks, it's important that we do have clean rootstocks as much as we have clean scion material. And that's because we depend on grafted grapevines, as I mentioned in the presentation, and that viruses are graft transmissible in nature, especially the ones that we're concerned about here, whether it's leaf roll virus, red blotch virus, so they could be spread through propagation. So if you have dirty scion material or dirty rootstock material, that can lead to health issues. And then we're continuing to spread viruses throughout our, throughout our nurseries and through the, all of our vineyards. So it's really essential that we do have a clean rootstock uh, material here in Canada as part of the domestic clean plant program. So there's a continued focus on, on the clean plant program here through CGCN, and we need to have clean rootstock material right here in Canada versus Im importation only. So, you know, and this takes a national effort. You know, this is something I learned from Andy and from others in the U.S. who have, who have developed these programs, is it takes, you know, the entity like CGCN, we need to have institutions involved, and we need to have everyone on board. And that includes the industry, and that includes the nurseries and everyone. We're in this together. Think of it, what we're dealing with COVID right now and how you have to deal with it. It's not just in isolation that we solve this problem. It's everyone that has to be involved and supportive. And think about it. We Right now, the US border is shut down. We can't, well, it's opening up. We can't go to the US. We can't drive there even in you know, the rest of this month even. So what happens if our borders get shut down for imported material? And we can't get rootstocks in from France. You know, we're going to have vine shortages. So we have to be taking care of this uh, domestically, and 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 really support what's happening with CGCN. And and then in summary, I'm just here. I'm uh, just trying to get finished up in, in time here. Uh, rootstocks are essential for Canadian vineyard production. You know, I I I think I I hope I laid that out to everybody. This is the reason why we need them here. And there's many benefits, whether it's resistance to the biotic stress or tolerance to abiotic stress. It can help our, our growth and our vigor and impact our uptake of nutrients. But we do we need and we need to continue to have regional studies of, of not only cultivars and clones, but also rootstock. And, and I think, and I hope that is a, a, a bit of a, a prelude to what Andy is going to talk about, about why uh, breeding rootstock is so important because it can be a real uh, benefit to an industry to be successful to have uh, proper rootstocks for the regions. And, you know, in, uh, and here in, in Canada, we're, we're dealing with a lot of variability in our weather. You know, we have to be tolerant to phylloxera and so on. In, in other regions, like in the, su in the southern U.S., California, like areas, uh, you know, where Pierce's disease is there, this is where it's really important to have proper rootstock and to have uh, regional studies done to, to evaluate what's best and to use some of the new material that's coming out and available. Because it's going to be important to adapt to the current situation, but also to adapt to climate change moving forward. And as I, as I said, the domestic rootstock production is going to be a critical component of what CGCN is up to. So I'd like to thank everybody you know, for, for all the support. Uh, so all of our industry partners, uh, CGCN and, and Agriculture, Agri-Food Canada uh, through the AgriScience uh, program for the, that's funding uh, our clone and rootstock studies. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer any questions and really looking forward to uh, Dr. Walker's presentation and then to be on the panel with everybody else to talk about some of these things. I can only touch upon what we're doing and the importance of rootstocks, but uh, looking forward to talk more with, with the group. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim, for your presentation and for stressing how important choosing the right rootstock is for a successful crop, not only the variety or the type of the rootstock, but ensuring that the material is clean as well, which is what CGCN is always trying to do. And so with that, uh, Jim has already expressed his uh, excitement for Andy's presentation, and I'm sure we can all agree. So without further ado, Andy Walker, grape breeder and viticulturist, Professor Emeritus in the Department of Viticulture and Oenology recently retired after over 30 years at the University of California, Davis. His lab studied genetics of resistance to pets, 
pests, sorry, diseases, intolerance to drought and salt stress. He released five rootstocks with strong nematode resistance in five Pierce's disease resistant wine grapes. And he held the Louis P. Martini Endowed Chair from 2000 to 2015 and has been the Louise Rossi Endowed Chair in Viticulture since 2015. And with that, I pass it off to Andy Walker. Thank you very much. Can you hear me, I think? Yeah. Yes, we can. Good, good. Okay, let me see if I can get this going. Ah, here we go. Okay, so good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, still morning where we are. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, fill in some of the holes and, and overview of, of what uh, Jim just finished talking about as well. And I think it, it bears repeating in almost every case and really emphasize the species and how important those are. And that'll, that'll both fill in gaps from, from the past and it'll help um, direct uh, decisions in the future and how we go about breeding new stocks and addressing different, different climates as well. So half of my work has been on, on Pierce disease uh, uh, in addition to rootstock work. So it's, it's about 50-50. So, and I'm not gonna talk about PD much and hopefully you won't experience Pierce disease, but we have found it in, in uh, Canada. It's been found in the East Coast in trees. It's not the same strain as for grapevines, but uh, it, it'll probably be found in many more places around the world and be, be fingered for the causal agent for a lot of problems we notice. Um, let's see here. So my projects have dealt with, with Rusak, of course, and phylloxera being the most important issue initially. I was hired after the big collapse of AXR1, which was never resistant to phylloxera anyway, uh, but it was a long sort of tragic story that went through. Um, but it really helped me keep, keep the focus on the need to make sure things are fully resistant to phylloxera. And I, I think we've done that pretty well over time. Nematodes are an increasing problem everywhere in the world. When I first started, people told me, you, you don't need to work on nematodes, they're not a problem at all. Well, they, they're a severe problem in, in many spots. And they're also a problem associated with agriculture as you repeat, repeatedly use lands and don't go through a crop rotation process, uh, you're going to build up these sorts of issues too. Uh, of course, drought and salt are hand in hand, and, and hopefully you won't experience that level of drought, but uh, BC would be prone to it, I think, in the south, uh, the whole southern part of, or eastern part of Washington as well, where we're going to see some increasingly problems there as well. And how do we address that? Uh, well, we address it with extreme vigor, and, and maybe that's not the best way to address it. So we're going to have to look at that and think about how best to adapt stock to those situations. And of course, tolerance of viruses. Uh, I've been working on uh, tolerating, tolerating, not resisting the, uh, the uh, virus diseases, but tolerating them as a means and approach to dealing with this, this persistent problem we have with plant, with plant materials and viruses. And it's very hard to control. It's very hard to condition human reactions to them. As you see, hopefully uh, uh, you're not quite as crazy as the, as the US COVID um, uh, public opinion brew that this, this continues to, to mix and, and meander. Uh, but we don't we don't have a lot of confidence in in our government apparently in terms of their ability to, to tell us what to do about viruses and it's the same is true in grape nurseries uh, and in, in the grape industry we we think oh well this will do fine but but not necessarily it's very important to have a very strong uh, certification program We're doing a lot of work with you, powdery if you don't milk. mind if I interrupt for a second do yeah. you have mm -hmm. your video on I hope so <laughs> well, uh, it seems to be. It's working on my my screen here. Let's see if you can get that up and working again. There we go. Perfect. That, better? Huh? that is perfect. Thank you. Um, sorry, sorry well, we about that. Too far. No, no problem. I've got too far with with the, with the visuals anyway. Um, so we've been working with these various diseases and pests for quite some time, 30, almost 40 years, actually. If I count my graduate school era, it's 40 years in the industry so far. Um, uh, and we've done most of that through classical breeding, but we've done a lot of work with developing genetic markers for, for diseases and pests as a means to expedite breeding. Uh, and eventually those will actually prove useful for, you know, to fully characterize resistance genes and perhaps use them in a more directed manner over time too. Let's see, let's come up. Now I've lost control of the slide of the advancer here. see it anywhere <laughs> do you see the slide to answer yes you have switched to the next slide okay uh good good um 
So let's go back to the history of rootstock breeding. It really began in the 1840s with the, uh, with the advent of the knowledge that powdery mildew and downy mildew were big problems that came from the Americas. And they were brought into France by horticulturists and plant collectors. Uh, and they were bringing in American hybrids that have been being produced for quite some time at that point as curiosities. Uh, and they brought them through and with them came fungal diseases. So really the impetus to get, get working on, on the rootstocks began uh, with, with, uh, with mildew problems. Um, we first imported mildew and then we imported phylloxera. It came hand in hand. Uh, and if you've not read the book, The Bonnest and the Vintner by Christy Campbell, that's an outstanding um, uh, history of, of the phylloxera crisis uh, in Europe. And it's well worth reading and very, very useful for everybody to think about it as well. Um, so phylloxera came across on the American species and the hybrids, and they weren't necessarily damaging on those, but of course all of Europe was on route at that point, and, and the, the phylloxera spread extremely quickly. We went through attempts to control the mildew diseases with Bordeaux mix and copper and lime and sulfur, and that worked pretty well. We also started breeding programs eventually to, to address uh, some of these diseases as, as well. Uh, powdery mildew was controlled by sulfur. We have uh, carbon bisulfide controlling phylloxera at that point as well, but not very well. Uh, it didn't, wasn't very, very effective. In other words, it was a three-pronged approach to solving this phylloxera crisis in Europe. The first was to kill the phylloxera, and that was done with carbon bisulfide. And in fact, uh, the movement of carbon bisulfide across Europe on the rail system uh, began, really initiated the whole French rail system, which is pretty, pretty amazing if you think about it, in the, in the European rail system. So the first approach from a breeding perspective was to produce hybrid direct producers, to produce the French hybrids that we, that we call them here. And of course they're careful not to call them that in France. Uh, but the, these were, were highly productive, mildew resistant uh, plants that with relatively poor quality wine, unfortunately, compared to vinifera. Uh, but they, they held the, the rain for quite some time in terms of an approach. And eventually people began counting on loose stocks with the knowledge that they could graft, as Jim was saying, they could graft the elite clones or varieties on, onto a whole range of different rootstocks to address these problems. So the rootstock situation really began then to address phylloxera. Um, almost everything that traces back from an American hybrid perspective or French hybrid perspective, uh, back to the same source as Jager 70, which had Dunsakumii and Rupestris in the background. And it was done in Missouri and was sort of the, the stalwart of our industry for quite some time, but it really went into the whole breeding program that developed the French hybrids. And the tragic thing about the French hybrids was that, that they were so close <laughs> to, to making good quality and high resistance at the same time. And we would have really solved a lot of our problems, current problems, if we had continued down that path for a little bit longer, another couple of generations to improve the quality and to, uh, to get things that were more or less indistinguishable from, from vinifera. But we didn't. So we, we developed this schism between the hybrid materials and, and uh, pure materials. In fact, they, they still call uh, uh, a lot of the rootstocks the Americans when you, when you talk about them in Europe. They're, they're not regarding the same sort of, sort of vein. Um, but we had a lot of breeders working on them, uh, and they slowly transferred into rootstock work over time to really develop uh, solutions. And Jim was saying, we talked about grafting already. It's an ancient practice. It's sometimes we think of it as being a relatively modern era practice, but it goes right back into China uh, pre-Christ pre, pre uh, for a long, long time ago. And it was used primarily with ornamentals and fruit trees for a very long time. And again, uh, he showed you the bench grafting process. So I won't, won't go into that. So they came to the US. They slowly figured out that they had to come back to look for, for evolved resistance to phylloxera and went back to the scene of the crime, which was, uh, as they found out, almost everywhere in the, in the United States and Canada, where we're going to grow phylloxera or thrive. Uh, and they re reasoned at that point that if, if they brought these materials back, they would be resistant to phylloxera and they could graft onto them. And so that slowly began, and uh, it, it took a while to develop. The, there's variable resistance in the American species uh, to phylloxera, but none of them collapse to phylloxera. So they range in terms of tolerance. They're able to, to adapt to higher or lower populations. And there are some that are, full, that are fully and truly resistant, like uh, some of the snaria materials, accessions of snaria and, and retentifolia, that, where they really aren't hosts at all to phylloxera. But they discovered, after they collected all this material, about 30 or 40 different species, if you, if you like, brought them back and started testing them. Uh, they discovered that only two would work as woodstocks because they're the only two that root. 
And of course, the entire uh, French and European grape industry was based on own rooted plants at that point, and they have to root it 80, 90 percent, 100 percent, and they do, and so do riparian repressors. So they planted those in the ground, they rooted, they, they became rootstocks, and nothing else rooted particularly well, so they, of course, were, were cast by the wayside. So they reconstituted the vineyards on vineyards on riparian repestris, and and uh, they began making hybrids between them uh, to, to work with them for some period of time. And they all they did really well for about ten years, and they collapsed to the lime induced chlorosis. So these are two species that'll grow on lime based soils very well, but if you graft them, they won't take up enough iron to supply the needs of the cyan. So it's another one of these really unusual cyan uh, rootstock um, interactions that, that much like Jim was mentioning earlier on. Uh, so they realized they'd have to come back and fix this problem, and they worked with T.V. Munson, the father of American viticulture, uh, who has another great book you can grab called The Foundation of, Amer of American Grape Culture that's really outstanding in terms of the species and, and the initial work on rootstocks as well. Uh, but they came back to the U.S., and Munson took them to, to Texas and said this is a huge limestone shield that should have some resistant plant material here, and they brought those back, but they found immediately, of course, that they didn't root very well. So they had to begin a privatization program. For land areas, the female parent crossing into things like riparian and repestris to, to develop a range of stocks. And there was a huge number of stocks that were developed between 1880, 1890, and, and the early 1900s. Uh, and almost nothing has been done since <laughs> 1925 or so in terms of rootstock development. Um, so that, that, that tells you two things. One, it tells you this is an amazing source of resistance. Uh, if it can last all that time uh, under an evolving pest, and still show no signs of collapse. It's, it's almost unheard of in terms of plant resistance studies in different crop systems. Uh, so they had taken advantage of that and we, st we, we still do at this point. There's our friend uh, T.V. Munson um, and uh, this website here, and I'm, I'm sure Darian can, can uh, move this, uh, the presentation to you at some point, but that site is, is uh, uh, essentially the whole photocopied version of, of uh, Munson's book. So if you don't want to fork out any money for it, you can go that way. So what else were they selecting? They had to first, of course, selected for rootability. That's the primary thing to be a rootstock. You, if you don't root, you can't graft. If you can't graft and you can't root, you can't be a rootstock. Uh, and we know now we could actually graft a lot of these materials through green propagation and get them going, but it'd be a much, at a much greater expense. So the dormant bench grafted process and field budded process is really the, the, the mainstay. Uh, so what else were they looking for? Well, they were really all nursery people. They were not uh, scientists primarily. They were not uh, viticulturists in many regards. They were nursery people. Uh, and they were looking at cane length, uh, how, much, how much material could they produce on a given stock or a given hybrid. Cane diameter, how they sized up and worked. Uh, the limited lateral production since the laterals detract from the length of that cane, plus they tend to be very shrubby oftentimes. Uh, early ripening of the canes in science so they could get material out of the field quickly and not have to worry about late frosts a late uh, early frost, early fall frost, or, or damage to the winter time. Uh, and then they thought about adaptation to wet and dry conditions. So if you take the smooth stalks and put them in two big groupings, they would be ones that were more adapted to a continental climate and ones that were more adapted to a Mediterranean climate if, if there are two big, big groupings. And they also looked at the diameter of the roots, whether they were large, large diameter or, or shallow and fibrous. And um, those are real traits that hold true. And they're the real traits that govern really the excess vigor or, or devigoration in new stocks that we see. So there's Hoparia, I'm sure you can picture that. I just want to go back over the habitat because oftentimes we don't, we're, we're flummoxed by rootstocks. We think, oh my God, there's so many choices. How am I going to figure out how to, how to approach the subject? And it's really most, most logically approached by thinking about the species that made those rootstocks and how they perform. And the hybrid complexes between the various types of species form as you'd expect and, and behave as you expect. And, and you can sort of see them and how they piece together. So here's Riparia along the, the Missouri River, right, right where Lewis and Clark put in uh, and started their way across the, the country in the waterways. Um, and that, that alluvial soil you see there is very silty. It's a very fine, silty, sandy sort of soil. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, these are all Riparia growing on the, on the bank here on the one side. And if you look across the river and look down those trees, they're full of Riparia too. And as, a, as those of you who live in the East Coast have already realized that the Riparia is on every plant almost. It's, it's ubiquitous. It's a tremendous, tremendous a wheat problem in some spots. Uh, but it's very adapted to moist climates and these alluvial sort of soils. Here's one of my students, Sirkwala in, in southern Missouri, where we've the, one of the few places you can still find Vitus repestris. It's almost extinct. 
And this plant is very, very different. So I wanted to, to show you this, this deep chasm here. Uh, and Rupestris is growing in the bank behind Eric uh, as almost as a shrubby little weed. It's not a great vine at all. And it was exterminated when they, in the 1840s when the US government decided that they needed to populate the country and they sent all the pioneers west on covered wagons and they of course stopped in creeks and whatnot. And those, those oxen and, and cattle ate uh, all the rupestris and essentially exterminated in a very short period of time. So here's a very important species that now essentially has gone from the wild. But we have very few representatives from, from, from the species that are available from germplasm repositories. I've made collections through Missouri and a couple of spots I found it in Texas over the years. Uh, we have those materials and you know, they, they look at for various traits, uh, but they're sort of intermediate. They don't act the same way as the original ones that were collected, which is, which is interesting. And if you look at that alluvium there, it's, it's a very coarse gravelly textured soil. It's not really a soil at all. And that these are highly erosive areas. So this plant survives by not growing in the trees intentionally. It grows as a shrub, the, the, the water passes over it, and it's, it, it has a very deep root system that holds itself in place uh, when, when, uh, uh, when these floods come through. It also grows in some pretty dry areas because those root systems are extremely deep. And this is the Wichita Refuge in Southern Oklahoma, uh, where I found rupestres too, just looking around, avoiding those buffalo and, and looking for the, the grapevines as much as I could. Uh, and you can see it here as a shrubby plant in this dry, dry creek bed that where it really has sort of dried out, but it survived because it can mine down in, in through that strata more effectively. And Vitus berlandieri, so riparian repestris for, for flox resistance and for ease of propagation. And then of course berlandieri came in for, the slime, for its slime tolerance. And here it is on a, a, after five years of drought in Texas on wild plum and wild oak, almost of those trees have defoliated. Uh, there's not much growth anywhere. There's no grass anywhere. This is not a grazed site. This is a, <laughs> this is a protected area. And that nice green stuff you see is Vitus berlandieri, still thriving along. Uh, so how does it survive? It has a very different sort of root system and it does both hydraulic lift where it pulls water from depth and then redistributes it through surface roots to keep the active roots near the surface alive. And this is a pretty well documented um, uh, desert plant sort of strategy, uh, drought, drought resistant strategy. And it works here in Berlandieri at the same time. It also has a different means of partitioning carbohydrates. So grapevines in general push everything to the tips. Uh, that's the primary sink of photosynthate. So it's moving into the tips, they're trying to grow, they're trying to outgrow trees and, and grow effectively and get more sun that way. Okay, so that's where the fr goes first. Secondarily, it goes into the trunk system that develops above ground. Uh, tertiarily, it goes into the fruit system if it has any fruit. Remember the wild species are either fruited or unfruited. They're male vines or female vines, which is, which is very important. And finally, in a normal grapevine, and what you have left over, what you have left over goes into the root system, uh, and it doesn't need a root system, right? It, had, it has a support already on the tree. It's growing in moist areas in almost every case, so it really doesn't emphasize that root system. But Berlandieri does. It's a it's a species that needs to put photosynthate into those roots and get them down and penetrate to the soil. So it's it's a it makes the vent, the vines much more vigorous oftentimes. But you can select Berlandieri by riparia like the teleki materials 5C and SO4. 420A is a different sort of case, but we can talk about that later if you like. But um, uh, th these plants are able to survive because they're selected to be more Berlandieri like and less riparia like, and, and you can get them through the hybrid complex. So we did a big study a few years ago on, on the genetic basis of the rootstocks. And you don't need to look about this, that this is really more to remind me, uh, but there are three major species in the rootstocks that, that, that make up 90% of all the rootstocks that we use commercially and internationally as well. And one of them is Berlandieri, and that's that red bar at the top. Another one is, is Riparia, that's the blue material uh, towards halfway down. And then back up about halfway is, is uh, Rupestris in the orange. Um, the funny thing is that, that we only have those three species. And again, that's based on their ability to propagate or not. Uh, and then the mixture of Berlandieri into, them, into those backgrounds. So that's the one, one minor problem or big problem. Uh, the second one is that they're, they're not only the same species, they're the same accession, the same genotype of those species that were used historically. So there's no genetic diversity in our rootstocks, our commercial rootstocks at all almost. Uh, it, it's really spectacularly bizarre. <laughs> and, and that they've lasted as long as they've had against phylloxera and against other pest problems is pretty remarkable too. So what does that say to the breeder? It says there's a ticking time bomb here ready to go off. 
that if, if a strain of phylloxera suddenly becomes more adept and more efficient on, on, on Berlandieri, on the Attic Session of Berlandieri, or on Repera Gloire, or on, on Repester St. George, we're in trouble. And we should be starting to think about developing new, even new standard stocks, not more exotic stocks, but the whole set of standard stocks to make sure we have some, some other material that, that has greater levels of phylloxera, perhaps. So that's, um, that's the take home message and, the, and the, really the take home uh, message about making sure that, that people like me get replaced. <laughs> so we're breeding new stocks for the future, even though they may be with similar species. Oh, back to, back to the drought for a second here. So there are, there's one truly drought resistant species, that's Vitus monticula there on your left. Uh, and it's growing on a, on a limestone embankment there. Most of that, that root matter that's growing there is it, it's exposed and sort of die back. Uh, and it's a remarkable plant. It grows without water. It's the only one of the grape species that grows without water. All the rest need have a permanent source of water nearby. It's either a catchment or there's a spring or there's a river or lake or whatever. Uh, and this is growing on mesquite and juniper in West Texas. So this is an amazing plant. And I've been, I worked on it for about 15 years trying to get to this basis of drought resistance and understand it more effectively. And, and unfortunately I gave up, or maybe fortunately I gave up at, at a certain point when I started reading more, more desert ecology literature. And lo and behold, one of the primary strategies for surviving the desert in dry conditions is don't grow. I mean, I'm not being facetious. These plants put on very little growth per year and they survive in that sense. And that's what Monticula does. So not only does it not root, it doesn't grow. So it, it's been left to the wayside of, of a rootstock um, parentage in the background. And the other adaptation is, is growth of, and size. And that's uh, typified here by Vitus candy cans. That's one of my students, Claire down there at the bottom. She's not, she's not very short. <laughs> and that's a hundred foot tall cottonwood tree with Vitus candy cans growing on it and pulling it down. Uh, so it's an amazingly vigorous plant. And it's another case of be careful what you wish for. Uh, this is going to generate a massive root system and a very deep plunging root system and a lot of vigor, maybe, maybe too much vigor in many cases. And the, for, for the more modern stuff now, we've been working a lot with Gertiana and Arizonica in terms of their salt tolerance. And here's Lake Mead, it's, it's just about as full as that now. <laughs> no, it's actually much less full than that, uh, but you can't see it in the background, but it's there. Uh, and here's one of the few pictures you'll see of fish, fish hook cactus next to grape and the grapes down there at the bottom of that little ravine too. So there are sources of resistance, but they're in streams, they're in springs, they're in uh, uh, sort of ephemeral sort of spots that will still maintain these vines over time. So that's Zion, it's a beautiful spot, full of wild grape as well. Uh, two or three species of grape, it turns out to be a fascinating group of materials. So when we look at these species, we think about riparian rupestris, and there's riparian in the north, and rupestris historically was sort of middle climate zone uh, in terms of its adaptability. It wasn't really a southern species, it was much more of sort of a mid-intermediate species. And again, think about it, it existing at one point from, from Pennsylvania down into Texas uh, before the cattle were turned loose, and it was primarily then a cold tolerant species in those situations, and riparia certainly for its cold tolerance. But Berlandieri is, is a warm climate species. It, it, is, it is not a cold tolerant species. And Vitus arizonica that's over here in the Southwest is definitely not a warm, warm species. These are things that are adapted to, to, um, um, to uh, much drier and, and much warmer conditions. And what we're gonna be using to address climate change largely, although we may try to fight it, uh, we're, we're gonna be working with some of these materials at some point. Uh, there are other species too that are available and a lot of them sort of mixed with these other types and, and I'll leave this for another time. Uh, but one of the important ones is, is Vitus acerifolia, uh, which has a wider range than this. In fact, uh, spreads further further across into the Southeast to uh, some degree, but Fulpina is there as well. I typically. So I've been collecting this stuff for ages and, and uh, for 35 years now, uh, my summer vacations have been wandering around the Southern United States collecting wild grapes. And we have about 1200 different uh, genotypes or accessions of these materials. And when I started this study, we knew there was one species in the Southwest uh, outside of Texas, and that was Vitus arizonica, maybe Vitus gurdiana and some of these spots. But it turns out they're all over the place and these different colors typify different species and different hybrid complexes between these species. And the good news is that they're in areas that, that are uh, com completely prone or you know, overwhelmed by Pierce's disease, by salt problems, by drought problems. Uh, by nematode issues, which is very really quite interesting. There seems to be some native 
uh, desert-like nematode species that, that feed on them too. And it transfers into other, other sorts of uh, interactions. Uh, and then salinity as well. The, these things down in Southwest Nevada and right along the Red River in Texas, between Texas and Oklahoma, have remarkable salt tolerance. They'll grow in 12% seawater. Uh, grow, not just survive. So they they're really are, are promising for the future in terms of how we're gonna manage water issues and, and uh, leaching. There's a Red River looking across to the Apache Indian Nation, uh, across the other side, and um, they're full of this Vitus duaniana and Vitus um, uh, champinii material, uh, and it's growing in this very, very saline area here. You can see those white streaks are all from a, after the drought, the Red River stopped flowing, and it, be, it began evaporating, it began evaporating, and it has become sort of a major salt flat. So we talked about, about Berlandieri and its partitioning and, and Riparia and its partitioning to some extent. And here's, here's a, a slide that shows you 110R, uh, Victor 110, and 101.14 side by side. And they're very different root systems. And, and they, this is what we wanted to work on a project to, to typify all these different backgrounds. And they really sort of match up with these species and, and their characteristics as, as well. Um, the problem with these studies is that, that you, first of all, they're roots and they're underground. They're very hard to work with and you can't really get good visuals. This, these are two-year-old plants that we pulled. Um, and we, we, we're, we did this to compare them to one-year-old plants that were done both herbaceously and with tissue culture. And no matter how we've done it, uh, as you look at these different root systems, even into older plants where we've excavated the whole thing with air spades, uh, these, this, these root characteristics are consistent from, from uh, in vitro to herbaceous to, to uh, full, full grown and field, field planted vines. Uh, so there, we can start grading these and characterizing them and, and um, uh, using this as a breeding tool as well, which has been very useful. You can see repair Gloir, a very fibrous nature. Ramsey's very plunging, big, thick rooted nature. They're, they're quite, quite unique, they're quite, quite acceptable. So we've been playing with that and uh, working towards better salt tolerance. Um, the rootstocks we've produced so far, uh, we won't talk about this, they're highly nematode resistant. Uh, they were aimed at nematode resistance. We didn't have a good solution for what happens when you've had a, root, a nematode resistant rootstock in the ground and you know you have high, relatively high levels anyway. Uh, what happens in the next generation if you plant with that same rootstock? And if you do, that rootstock dies. You it can't be planted into extremely high populations that have existed there. And the, and the nematodes have become better adapted to that rootstock as well. So we need to rotate. We need to consider fallow sy uh, systems to try to, to beat these things as well. But we have rootstocks now that will resist most of the most important nematodes uh, and, and uh, do it fairly well. I wanted to show you this because there are mixtures of different species. So we have rotundifolia in the background here, rufotomatosa, which is an unusual form of estivalis, but normally something we don't see in, in most rootstocks. We have riparia in there. You can see riparia dancing around all over the place. Why is it in there? Uh, if, if it's, why are we being so consistent in its use? Well, it's back, back again to the fact that if we don't have riparia, there can't be rootstocks. They've got to be able to root. And we, we need to, to really uh, emphasize that part as we go through. And the industry complains about GRN1 that it won't root very well, and it doesn't. But you, if you do uh, take heed of uh, several pretty simple um, procedures, you can, you can get fairly high percentages too. So they're slowly learning to adapt with that stock. The GRN2, 3, and 4 have been no problems. They're starting to, to be used fairly, fairly well across um, uh, nematode sites in California, both deep and shallow soils. They're, they're moderate vigor, moderate plus vigor, I would say, like a 5BB or a 1103 Paulson in terms of their overall growth. And the GRN1 hasn't been propagating very well, and we're working on why. Uh, is there some sort of virus issue that we don't fully understand yet, or why, why aren't they propagating as well as we hoped? So what else do we need? We need, again, more nematode resistance, but we need it primarily in combination with different sorts of nematodes. So we need to have make sure we have complex resistance that really addresses these problems more effectively. Uh, we need better drought tolerance. We need better salt tolerance. We need better virus tolerance. <laughs> we need a lot. And in fact, I've been giving a talk uh, over the last few months that really says 30 years of rootstock breeding and we're just getting started. Uh, and it really is the truth. There's, it takes a long time to figure out what directions to be headed in and what, what, what has potential. And then you realize it takes a long time to finish those materials off too. So there's, there's another lifetime or two worth, 
for their work to go through. And we'll, we'll be using warmer climate species. So that we're gonna have to deal with how to address that. Do we change our production practices to accelerate growth, cut down on irrigation and fertilization, and really try to make sure we ripen these plants effectively in, in October? Uh, so we have good, good wood for, for wintertime storage and cold tolerance, or, or do we, we approach this from, from, a, from a fruit production perspective as well, where we're looking at this warmer climate and trying to avoid the hottest spells? There's some work been going, uh, going uh, down in India and Brazil recently, and they've always had the ability to have double and triple cropping in those countries with, with the tropical climate, uh, which is pretty interesting. The vines don't last very long, usually seven or eight years, but, but you're able to double and triple crop them. But now they're realizing that they could have much better quality if they could time the ripening of these uh, vines more effectively. So now they're using multiple cropping systems to target a ripening date where the where where uh, uh, where, where rainfall is less severe and the, and, the, and the fruit will ripen more successfully without fungal damage. So, it's, so there's lots of things we'll be able to play with in terms of addressing the future, but we need to start. The future is not is now. Right? The future is is going on in terms of virus change. So I won't go over this, but you can you can look at these um, as, 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 at your own leisure as well. But again, the the rootstocks. Uh, and knowing their parentage will give you a great deal of information about what you can expect from them. It's really quite important. And there's a few things that, that um, vary that quite, quite substantially between these materials that, uh, that are hybrid forms. But in general, they take on sort of an intermediate behavior. So the Blander Perry ones really have been getting a short shrift in the US for quite some time. We sort of moved away from them and there's no apparent reason. Uh, so uh, that, that's one of the major issues we have about rootstock choice and rootstock availability is availability. It's what do the nurseries provide and how much do they have? And the industry recently has gone almost entirely to 1103 Paulson and 10114 in California. And really the most important reason why is because they're easy to propagate and they generate lots of cuttings. So it's a, it's a different sort of a perspective. They're not necessarily the best root systems and best, best plants. 10114, for instance, has almost no adaptation to deficit irrigation. That's a huge problem. Its root system dies back into those systems and takes a long time to regenerate and, re, and take off again during, during, the, uh, during successive cycles of, of drying, if you like, and, and then moisture again. So there's big, big issues there. Uh, 1103 Paulson has been said to be nematode resistant and, and salt tolerant, but it's not. And if you run these trials through to your 10 to 15 when we, that we don't like to do as viticulturists because it takes too long to publish. Uh, if we did run them through those time periods, we'd notice that it's, it's not performing well in the later phase of life. So the root stocks actually group, group into those three groupings too. Things that do well when they're young, things that do well when they're sort of intermediate in age and stuff that makes it through the whole process in the years 25 and 30. Although by then they're starting to die from, from trunk diseases and these things as well. So it's, it's a bit, bit tricky to judge those. Okay, I don't. I won't show you these, um, and I'll say thank you. And just to remind you about a few other important issues. One, one is a firm relationship between the science going on, the productions that, that that's going through, and the nursery industry. That those group, groups need to speak to each other on a regular basis to, to sort of guide what needs to be done next in terms of stocks and how to both best approach and and, and address those those issues too. So availability is key. You can't have a rootstock if it's not available. And then you end up, end up making bad choices, like going over the border to California to, to less certified materials, perhaps, and bringing them back. Uh, that, that's not a, a good approach. Uh, the same could be said about, about Europe. We need to have uh, regional and national certification programs because those decisions are site-specific oftentimes. They're specific to a, to a region and a country, and this is not necessarily a broad, broadly a general situation. Uh, okay, so. With that, I think I'll um, turn the mic back over to Darian and maybe answer some questions if you have some. Thank you very much, Andy, for that presentation. Mm -hmm. And before we move into our panel discussion today, I just want to remind all of our audience members that there is a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions for our panel here, please put them there and we will try our best to address all questions within the session today. And firstly, I would like to uh, introduce our two additional panel guests. So firstly, we have Mike Watson, Senior Viticulturalist of Artera Wines Canada. Mike grew up in the Okanagan Valley and now lives in Caledon, BC with his family of three children. He has received a Bachelor of Science in Agroecology from the University of British Columbia, focusing on sustainable plant systems and food safety. After working in plant pathology, Mike joined the wine industry with Artera Wines in 2001. 
Over the past 20 years, Mike has been responsible for the development of both internal vineyards for Artera, as well as consulting and designing vineyard developments for growers. Mike's passions for outside of viticulture include mountain biking, fishing, camping, and coaching youth sports. And to introduce uh, Bill Shank, Vice Chair of CGCN. Bill Shank is the fourth generation of the Shank family involved in farming. Growing of grapes on the farm dates back more than 60 years. Currently, the Schenck family grows five varieties of grapes, Chardonnay, Cabernet Sauvignon, Syrah, Merlot, and Pinot Noir for Artera wines. Bill currently sits as vice chair on the Grape Growers of Ontario and the Canadian Grapevine Certification Network's board of directors. He was crowned Grape King and serves as an ambassador for the Ontario grape and wine industry during 2009 to 2010. Outside of the grape and wine industry, Bill is also heavily involved with sports in the Niagara community, holding the position of the pre president of the Royal Canadian Henley Regatta, from 2000 to 2020 and winning the Rowing, Rowing Canada President's Award three times. So with saying that, I now present Ross Wise to moderate our panel discussion for the day. Okay, thanks very much, Darian. So uh, I thought first we'd start with Mike and Mike, uh, really appreciate you joining us today. I realize rootstocks might not be perhaps top of mind given the, uh, the fire situation at the moment. and. Um, we certainly hope that your uh, your team and, and their families are safe and and uh, no damage has been incurred. But um, with that being said, I know you love rootstocks as well, and you were pretty excited to join us and discuss rootstocks. So maybe from your perspective, I know you you have a lot of acres that you farm with Artera and work with a lot of growers. What are the key issues relating to rootstocks that you see in BC now, and and what do you see as the future? What's going to become the big issues of the future for you? Yeah, thanks, Ross. Um, yeah, I guess, uh, first of all, I just say thanks to Jim and Andy for their presentations today. That was extremely thorough and, and really um, informative and uh, fills a lot of the gaps in, uh, in my uh, knowledge on the history and sort of the, the missing pieces. So I, I really appreciate that. Um, I guess, uh, you know, for me, um, current issues uh, in the industry here, um, there's several, <laughs> obviously, nothing's just perfect everywhere, but uh, um, right now, currently in the industry, and, and sort of to answer, Jim, your question there about uh, rootstocks used in the Okanagan and in BC, and, and I'll speak mostly to the interior of the Okanagan, uh, so that's where I am. I don't have a lot of exposure to the coast or the island. But basically, of all the rootstocks out there, we're, we're basically looking at Riparia 10114, 3309, and uh, SO4 is, is sort of the main four that are grown here. Um, and within that, uh, I guess, uh, in, in my rough uh, analysis of how we use those when planting, we sort of look at those Riparias seem to do quite well here on uh, loamy sand soils, uh, deep loamy sand soils where we can control irrigation and nutrition. Uh, if we get to heavier soils that have a uh, better water holding capacity, where we're looking at more of the deeper silty soils is where we really like to use a 1014 for bigger control. And uh, we don't seem to have that issue with, uh, with the uh, drought issue if we have a little bit better water holding capacity. Um, so on the, uh, the, the gravelly till soils we have in the Okanagan, we're typically looking at uh, 3309. And then uh, the fourth one there is that SO4, uh, which has been used sort of on a variety of soils, but it's a little bit falling out of favor here. And I guess um, for me, the, the main issue is that we, we're sort of looking at those three, four root stocks, and we've got a vast multitude of different soil types in the Okanagan Valley. Um, about 13 years ago, I developed a vineyard that had nine different soil types on 60 acres. and uh, we sit there and look at sort of three or four rootstocks to fit on that. Um, so definitely selection and uh, the ability to choose from a wider range of rootstocks would be certainly something that we'd look at. Um, and But what goes with that as well is that, uh, you know, our industry is relatively young with most of the plantings that we're, we're actively farming being planted within the last 25 years. And, uh, uh, and for me, being involved in the industry for the last 20, you sort of see how that succession goes as the industry builds and develops. And uh, generally, people have been looking to what has worked and what has been planted. And everything sort of sources back to that initial uh, stab at it that people took when they first started planting. And uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, some more research and, and some more trials. And the problem is that nobody wants to do them here. It's, and Andy kind of leaded to that is that 
it takes so long to get results is that nobody ever really starts those or follows them through. And so some more work on that end. And, it, and it's something that's been a personal interest of mine, which we've never really uh, taken on as a project for those exact reasons, because there's costs and time and land and everything involved. Um, so uh, that's another part of it. And then, uh, I mean, the other part is that uh, there's a lack of knowledge here uh, in the industry. We don't have third, three, four, fifth generation farmers out here. Most people are coming in from other industry or from different commodities and everybody's starting relatively new. Uh, it's still a young industry. And uh, usually it's time is of the essence. Uh, land is extremely expensive in the Okanagan. There's property selling for, you know, well above $300,000 an acre now. And, uh, uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on these plantings. So uh, we do see uh, there is a bit of a trend lately. And the, the other part is availability. And uh, I know it's a tough business to be in with nurseries. And I know that there's a big time delay to get plants developed. Um, and we're sort of in a situation in the Okanagan where people get on property. It's really hard to, if you're competing to buy properties, you're spending a lot of money to buy them. And then you want to get something planted so you can have some money coming in as soon as possible. So when you're looking at, uh, you know, reducing those costs after you bought a lot, and if there's not that knowledge component there, a lot of people are going to choose own rooted vines because they can get them made for approximately half the cost. Uh, and just for reference, I mean, the cost of grapevines here over the last several years, I mean, a long, long ago, we were paying $289, 3, $325 for vines, and now we're looking at uh, sort of a minimum $5 to upwards six, six fifty dollars a vine, and that's uh, people out here are planting on 7 by 3 spacing, so that's almost 2,100 vines an acre, so it, it adds up in a hurry, so uh, that's a lot of pressure put on that as well, so. Sure, yeah. All right. Um, yeah, thanks very much. If I get time, I might come back with a question about SO4 because I wouldn't mind digging a bit deeper on that. But for now, maybe we'll, um, we'll we'll go over to Bill and just sort of get a similar question for you, Bill. What do you think the key issues are in Ontario um, about regarding rootstocks at the moment? And what do you think is going to become more important in the future? So again, uh, just like Mike did, I'd like to thank uh, Andy and Jim for, for the presentation today. I, I as well learned a lot more about uh, Rootstocks that I ever knew uh, was out there, especially dating back into the 1800s. And so uh, I appreciated uh, the presentation today on that. So we, I take a look at uh, what's going on in this area. And, and for the most part, uh, rootstocks have been di dictated to by the, the nurseries and what the nurseries have been doing. And so much similar to what they're doing in BC, Riparia 3309 SO4, and now a little bit more of a 101.14 is being planted in, in this area than it was in the past. And so, I, again, I think uh, the, the critical part about uh, what you're doing with your rootstocks and, you know, uh, Ontario is uh, a little bit ahead of BC when we, when we talk about the history and how long we've been doing this. But I think some of the things that we're learning is, is some of the initial plantings that had uh, the different rootstocks, people when they go to replant now, are taking a closer look at the rootstock that they're using. They're taking a closer look at the clone that they're using with that rootstock. And they're also looking at the variety that uh, they're planting on the site conditions that they have. So I think it's, it's all encompassing here. And when we talk about uh, the clean stock program and how that all leads through, I think that there's now a new focus on how it, it starts uh, right from the rootstock through this ion and into the growth that you're going to get. And I think that, uh, you know, the climate conditions are changing around here. I, we're not as extreme uh, most years as they are maybe in BC. But again, uh, we, we have gone through some drought periods and that uh, some of the, the rootstocks have seemed to come through better than some of the other ones. And so I have lived and experience on 10114, but in the drought year that I did did see that uh, the growth uh, definitely wasn't the same with uh, 10114 that it was with 3309. The majority of my plantings are 3309, although I have had some experience with the, the SOFR on some of the earlier plantings. I just was not happy with the growth that I, that I saw with the, the SOFR compared to the 3309. I think one of the, the nice things, and uh, having Jim on here, um, I offered one of our sites up for Jim to do a lot of his trial work on different rootstocks. And so being, being in the industry and realizing that the amount of change that's gonna be required as we go forward, 
I thought it was a great opportunity for me personally on, on our operation to take a look at what the different uh, research trial that uh, Jim's working with. And he's got a two acre block here that uh, he's trialing different uh, varieties, different clones and different rootstocks. And so uh, early indications on some of the material, uh, some of the material didn't do very well at all. And so I'm glad I didn't plant that here on my site. It may do better on other sites, but uh, it's been a pretty good learning when you see a two acre block with all the different trials that are being conducted on that to see what, what's doing well and what isn't doing well. And so I think that uh, that that's pretty well key. And, and we, we talk about all the different things that are taking place with climate change. And as we go forward, I mean, I mean, virus has been one of the, the big things that especially in the last three, four years has uh, really started to come to the forefront. Although we don't have all the nurseries buying into the clean stock program that CGCN has been providing, we, we hope that as we continue down this path, that, that through the growers that are looking to plant new, new grapevines, and, and there's quite a few out there now because they've had infected ones, that uh, people are starting to realize that uh, the clean material not only is, is in the vine itself, but the rootstock as well. And so I think that uh, that's some of the learning things that uh, we've been learning about, especially in the, in the last little while. And, and so we talked today about CGCN and, and where CGCN has come from. And so, you know, CGCN has only been around for three and a half, four years now. And so it uh, for 10 years before that and 25 before that, we identified that virus was a problem and that uh, it, it's taken until the last three and a half years that the country across Canada, all the grape growing regions have come together to realize and trying to work towards solutions to, to, to address this. And so um, if I take a step back, I don't even think uh, today's seminar would be happening if we weren't be pushing for this through the, the clean stock program and some of the issues that have arisen in, in the last uh, few years because of the climate change and the conditions that we're growing in. So again, I think these uh, seminars are, are very worthwhile and very helpful to, to look at the insight and uh, especially when we talk about rootstocks here today. I, I know uh, for uh, growing in uh, the peach industry that nematodes were always uh, a real issue, especially when we planted back-to-back -back years with peaches and soil fumigation was uh, necessary in those days when we went back uh, in with uh, peaches on peaches. And so um, when I got in growing more and more grapes, uh, people said, you don't have to worry about nematodes. And so as I hear today more about nematodes, then um, I, I'm becoming more and more familiar with uh, some of the one issues that were created with peaches. And so I'm uh, not surprised to hear that the grapes, it's an issue as well, but on the sandy soils, nematodes have always been an issue. And so uh, rotation back uh, to back on grapevines, I've seen it myself where the growth is not what we had hoped for. And I've talked to many growers about uh, planting grapes on grapes and the issues of uh, expecting longer terms before you can get the growth. Great, thanks very much for that, Bill. Um, we've got a heap of questions piling up in the Q&A, so I think we might just switch over to them and maybe I'll just ask the, the first one on the list and work down from there. Um, maybe this is for Jim. Can you recommend some rootstock suitable for the wet valleys of the BC Southwest? Riparia Gloire springs to mind for me, but maybe you've got a, a better suggestion there. Yeah, it probably would be something with the riparia in its in its background, so riparia gloire or or something like that. I I don't know exactly what the the conditions are in that in that area, but um, maybe I'll ask Andy to ask his, his opinion on that as well. Whatever you do, diversify. That's the, I think key to to address these issues. Um, and also, you've got to do some prognostication of what's happening next. And, and it, is it going to get wetter or is it going to get drier? We don't really know that, but there's a good chance it's going to get drier. And, and the vineyard decision is a 30-year process, if you're lucky, 20 if you're not so lucky. But even then, it's a long-term decision. And, and I, I would always err, err on the side of, of more vigor and more adaptation than, than, than less and, and less uh, offering ability to, to adjust the plant that way, too. Okay, thank you. Another question in the, the Q&A from Faith, um, maybe Jim or Andy, are there any trade-offs in rootstock cold hardiness versus drought or disease tolerance? Um, obviously, 
drought and uh, and cold hardiness is a big issue in, in BC in particular. So is there any perfect solution there or any trade-offs? So, so, so I'll just, just interject it quickly. Um, we're dealing right now with a very serious issue, lots of freezing and, and drying damage from, from cold, very cold Novembers, uh, sub-freezing sub Novembers, and also through, through the winter time, if plant material hasn't hardened off well enough. So we're getting this longer cycle of seasonal growth uh, with, with the climate getting warmer. At the same time, we're getting these very abrupt cold frosts and cold fronts that come in before the vines are hardened off and we're seeing damage in nursery fields and, and in one and two and three year old vines too that are becoming more common. Uh, we're gonna to have to go up and talk with our friends in the North to <laughs> figure out, out how to slow vines down earlier and more, more appropriately. Okay, um, and uh, Samuel, I'll skip down to your question. Can you comment a bit more about adaption to wet soils, especially standing water in the early spring? I think that's probably for you again, Andy. Uh, well, anyone who's dealt with, with wet conditions, grapes don't like wet, air, wet, wet scenarios. One of the few that does well in a very clay and heavy clay, mucky soils for us is 1616C. Uh, it, it's, it's outperformed most other things over time, but it's not a very strong stock and it has a lot of other weaknesses that, you know, you're sort of stuck. So the best answer would be drainage. And if you can't afford drainage, go to, go to a different site. <laughs> it might be the best. Okay. I agree. There you go. Uh, moving on to Adam's question. Uh, has there been any, any research on the use of interstock uh, to hopefully combine traits of two existing rootstocks? See Andy nodding there. So we've tried that a few times, and mostly and failed pretty pretty abruptly. So uh, it, it doesn't really act as a as a pre preventive barrier. We've been looking at it again more recently with virus resistance, and we do have true resistance to, to some of these viruses, prevents them from moving through the vascular system very effectively, um, and it might have some hope. But so far, no. <laughs> and we we have. Uh, in, in terms of family virus, we've, we've put uh, several interstock combinations together and they've never really done very much, unfortunately. And um, Hans has asked a question, a question along similar lines. Are there any rootstocks that can induce some resistance to trunk diseases in the soil? Mm, no, <laughs> that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I shouldn't be so facetious. Um, uh, grapevines are not a long lived plant. Uh, they don't last very long. They're, sh they're short-lived weedy species, and if you think of them as a plant in the, in the habitat. And, and uh, all these fungi are there in place as part of the whole plant and, and, and the ecological cycle to break down the wood, right? We, we couldn't survive if it wasn't for the, all these fungi that are, we, we call young vine decline, old vine decline, and, and wood rot fungi. Um, they're there to break down cellulose, so we, don't, we have room for everything else. And they get into the grapevines early on. You're in big trouble if they get in later in the site in the cycle. Then it's, we have to deal with them. But we we're, there's some work that's starting to look at um, adaptability and how long things might last under a given fungal load. That's just started uh, in many regards. We had some projects years and years ago looking at a few of the fungi that didn't really come to much much uh, conclusion at that point. Uh, but it's, it's normal. They're supposed to rot. <laughs> That's one of the problems. And we encourage that by pruning too severely and growing them too severely and chopping them back too much, et cetera, et cetera. But, but it's almost impossible to keep these things out of, out of a, a wood system. Okay. Um, I'm going to read Helen's question. I think it's directed to Bill, but anyone else that wants to jump in as well can, can have a go. Um, any thoughts about how to get all nurseries on site? So maybe I'll take a stab at this at first. And so... As uh, we've been doing with CGCN, we've been hoping that uh, it would be the industry that pushes the nurseries to, to come on site. And so as growers, we have choices of where we want to buy our nursery stock from. And so what we've been suggesting over the last couple of years is, is that you should be talking to your nursery, finding out exactly what's going on and why they're doing what they're doing and if it's part of a clean stock program and why they uh, don't want to become part of CGCN. And so we've talked to all the nurseries, the nurseries that are growing uh, grapevines. And uh, there's been some new nurseries that have started up that uh, have come to us and wanted to be part of the system. And so we can only encourage the growers to go out and, and do their part on this to make sure. And so as Andy talked to the last part of his uh, presentation about getting everyone on side and working down the same pathway. And so that's what we're hoping that we can do. 
and that we can keep pushing and that uh, at, at a point in time, whether because we're so young and new in, in forming CGCN that uh, they don't believe it's possible that we can do what we say we're going to do. Well, we've built a lot of momentum up over the last couple of years here. We're starting to see some of the breeders talking to us and wanting to put stuff in our program. We can only hope that that continues and that we continue down the path and showing that we're on the right track here with the clean stock program for Canada. So as a result of anything that happens internationally, that we will still have our own clean material that we can be proud of. Okay. Anyone else got anything to add there? Or can move on? I would just, uh, I just uh, agree with uh, what Bill said there. Um, if, if you're developing a vineyard, you're looking to buy vines, um, there's a lot of blind faith in that. And um, I think that that is what needs to change. And like Bill said, you need to talk to your nursery well ahead and talk to multiple nurseries, find out where their stock came from, what the status of the stock is, um, what the availability is and, and do the research ahead of time and talk ahead. And, and honestly, like what we do now is we custom order stuff well ahead of time to make sure that we get what we want. And uh, there's not a lot of stuff produced on spec. And uh, if it takes a year to get it right, I just think that you need to take, uh, it's not about getting the nursery so much on board. I mean, it's up to them to do that. We can't force any industry to do what, what they're gonna do, but uh, we can take control of that ourselves and go out and find the best possible material. Make sure that it's what you want and what you need. Um, and if the nursery is forthright and coming forward with all that information, then you, you can make a good guess on, on what's going to be successful. And I so just to add to that is, is that we've also been talking to the wineries that uh, purchase the grapes from the growers and making sure that the wineries are working on our behalf as well, because the issues that uh, the wineries have about uh, grapes not coming in and being as sweet or with, uh, just the quality of the grapes that are coming in, some of the issues that the wineries are having, we're asking that the wineries talk to their growers as well, try and encourage them to make sure that what the, their growers are planting are of the clean nature. Thank you, Bill and uh, Mike there. Um, maybe while you guys have the floor, um, a question from Steve. Has anyone noticed a problem with Pinot Noir on 10114 rootstock, um, particularly clones 777 and 828? And, and maybe Jim, you've maybe you've done some trials with this as well. Obviously, it can be a site specific issue, but is there is it something you've noticed? In, in our trials, nothing right away. We haven't seen any issues, but um... As uh, Andy said, you know, the, you have to look at these things uh, short term, medium term and long term. So uh, right off the right at the get go, we haven't seen anything that jumped out to us in our trials because we do have Pinot Noir, uh, 777 and 828 on 101.14, but um, it, they're still young. So we'll see. I'm not okay. sure if any of the growers have any comments on, on, on that, uh, on those combinations. Uh, from our perspective, uh, what we've got uh, for Pinot Noir on 101.14 is actually doing really well. Um, my only comment would be that uh, we do have that on heavier, deeper, silty soils at that 101.14 where it does extremely well. Um, but we don't have a, a mass amount of plantings on that. We're talking maybe two or three blocks, uh, 15, 20 acres or so, but no problems on our end. Well, the experience I have with Pinot Noir was all on uh, 3309, not on 10114. And on the sandy soils, uh, it was just too vigorous for me, especially when we came to cropping and uh, ripening. Uh, sour rot was always a huge issue on the sandy soils and, and being too vigorous. Okay. Um, another question from Hans. Other other drought resistant rootstocks that do not rely on a large root system architecture that increases vigor? Maybe Andy, you've got some experience with that? Uh, no, it's a quick, quick answer again. In general, all the drought resistance we have, except for the case of 110R, I think, uh, that they, and maybe 420A, and maybe there are a couple that actually act, are true, truly more devigorating and, and adaptable. But I think the 110 does that through partitioning and slow growth through the season. So if you, if you could measure a, an aliquot of water uh, in a suitcase or something, and you gave it to 10114, and you gave it to 1103 Pulse, and you gave it to 110R, the 10114 will use it up very quickly. The 1103 Pulse would be sort of intermediate, 
and and the four twenty and the four twenty eight would be slower, and the one ten R would be slower. They would use the water more like Berlandieri does, and, and they don't grow as rapidly. They they don't push out as rapidly from the spring and all the way through the season, and they use water more conservatively. But they're on a big root system, and you, when they're in a deep soil and you're and you're providing a lot of water, they're going to grow excessively in some of those cases too. So. Yeah, you have to be careful of that. But we've been looking for that magic bullet, the drought, true trout tolerance without excess vigor. And it really is a very uncommon feature. And it's, it's been hard to breed into the process yet. I think maybe my successor might, <laughs> might take a crack or two at that over time. Um, but it, it's not, not an easy one to solve. OK. Um, Jordan, I haven't forgotten your question. I'm saving it for last. Uh, maybe we'll go to Brian's question now. Um, how can grape nurseries um, access AR rootstocks in Canada? Um, I'm not sure who's best to answer this, but if anyone's got any ideas, please jump in. I guess the short answer is you can't. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't seen it. I'm assuming that's the Arizona. Is that what, is that what that's referring to? Yeah, what's the AR referring to? The new, new stocks? Maybe Brian, if you could uh, retype your question uh, with, with a bit more detail there. But um, while we're waiting for that, uh, Helen's asking, any thoughts about looking more closely at the very wide range of riparia for greater winter hardiness since RGM originates from Missouri? I can see some nodding, so feel free to jump in, guys. I think that's a, a, something somebody should be doing. Not me, <laughs> somebody should be doing in a cold climate and and uh, should be done experimentally and and in, the, in sight as well for, for sure and there'll be differences you know riparia is an amazing species it ranges from there's a few things that are mostly riparia like in, in texas not very much and it goes all the way from texas right up across the border and across to the eastern seaboard it's remarkable and, and in that range it has to be quite different and it's never really been challenged like that question's been uh, poked around a little bit but it's never really been addressed fully um, Alexandra's just uh, asked the question, uh, please describe soil and site evaluation and testing procedure to choose rootstock. Jim, I might steer this to you and maybe if you could just talk a little bit about nematode um, occurrence in Canada, what types of nematodes and how widespread and how big a concern are they? Because I'm, I'm not aware of a lot of nematode testing going on in Canada, so maybe you can just speak to that as part of the site evaluation. Yeah, we're not actually looking at the type of nematodes in our in our vineyards that we're doing the trials on, actually. So we're uh, that's something maybe we should be looking at in the future. Um, so, in terms of how we've set up our sites, is we've we've randomized the block uh, with the different varieties with different uh, uh, clone and rootstock combinations. Uh, so we're you know we're having and we're managing the vines exactly the same. And, and that's how we're, we're evaluating uh, these blocks. Um, so the first of all is to have it planted properly. And then um, we're looking at different soils as well. So we're trying to uh, have it randomized and look at different co soil comparisons. So we can try to um, uh, evaluate these in different scenarios, but at the same time, we're, we're comparing grapes to grapes per se, right? We're, we're, it's a randomized experiment. So it's not like this, this area on this cultivar, this clone, this rootstock has a much different soil than this other one. And that's for the reasons why you're getting the differences, not so much uh, the, the plant material itself. But it would be interesting to look at, uh, it, to do more in-depth uh, analysis of, of what's in the actual vineyards and, and uh, with respect to um, nematodes and, and, and so on. That's, that's a good thing to think about, I guess. Okay. Part of that um, is also uh, the chronic nature of nematodes too. So it really needs a, an agricultural system in place for a, a generation or two before you start seeing uh, those interactions clearly where, you, where they become a problem. Okay. And then it's frightening. <laughs> um, so Brian's uh, got back the rootstock he was referring to uh, when will nurseries have available in Canada was the ones that you were developing, Andy. The, uh, mm -hmm. It might have been your, your own but, personal rootstocks. Yep, yeah, those are all available now from, from grape nurseries in California. I don't know that Canada's imported them yet, so they could, they could be imported into Canada fairly, fairly simply. Okay, um, we'll take one more question, and uh, then I think uh, Darian will 
tell you how to get all your unanswered questions across to these to the panel here. Um, maybe I'll take uh, Elizabeth's question because she's asked it to be directed specifically to Andy. Do you know of any vineyards trying lower vigor rootstocks and how have they feared? Um, so yeah. sure, sure. That's that's been the quest by a lot of, of a lot of people. Uh, and I think most rootstock trials identify things like 10114 and and uh, 420A, very different sort of behaviors, but both quite quite devigorating in many ways. Um, it's also been the case of one of my new rootstocks, the GRN1, uh, which is remarkably low vigor. In fact, it's the only example so far we've seen where this plant has 20 to 25 percent less vegetation and equivalent yields in a, to other systems, which is supposed to be the the, the holy grail, right? <laughs> We're looking for good productivity and reduced vegetative growth, so less leafing, less shoot, shoot thinning, all etc. However, uh, those plants grow so slowly that people are suspicious of them at this point. <laughs> so I keep telling people, don't don't worry, it'll it'll, it'll ripen the crop. Um, but it's a very different plant and. and it, it goes back to this question of what you're looking at and that how the site is so important too. Uh, on a deep soil with lots of water, none of the rootstocks we grow in California are any different from any other. They all grow the same way. If you cut the water back suddenly, they'll be very different. If, if, you, if you reduce the depth of that soil by half, it'll be very, very different. But until you put the stress on them, nothing, nothing is, is observable. Yeah. Uh, and maybe just I'll steal one more question. Sorry, Darian. Um, just to direct to Mike because I wanted to ask this myself. SO4 has been much maligned, particularly by winemakers, and I've certainly said a few nasty things about it myself over the years. But um, given climate change, given that our seasons are getting longer and drier, do you think there's a future for SO4 after all? I think, in the terms of uh, like stable production, um, it may play a role. And uh, again, it, we'll have to see how it how it plays out. I mean, it, it's pretty much fallen off the radar, and I don't see any much like very very little is getting planted in the last few years. Um, we've got a fair fair chunk of so far planted because a lot of our vineyards, uh, our big vineyards are all planted in the late 90s and uh, so far was uh, sort of top of list at that time. And uh, so we've had, you know, I've had the privilege of, of looking at the wines made from SO4 versus the other three rootstocks and own roots over the last 20 years. And uh, uh, in general, um, and again, this is just very, very general. It's not varietal specific or anything, but uh, We've seen a general trend um, from a wine quality perspective that it, it, it produces decent wine. Um, it's not a problem on that end, but uh, to get to the, the higher end values, what we consider our, our tier one, tier two stuff is that uh, we got a better probability of getting there with some of the other rootstocks um, and especially on some of the later reds and things like that. But uh, what we've seen, if you take out that winemaking component and I still think there's a lot of work to be done on that end and um, uh, I think from a viticultural perspective what we see in the vineyards is that it's always higher bigger um, you know when we get into times of drought because of that bigger bigger it seems to be a little bit more stable um, and what we do see is that it does uh, in general produces uh, a little more crop and and a little more um, you know year over year sustainable heavier crop loads uh, but with that comes the compromise of that varietal expression and what the winemakers don't really like so you know there might be a place for it um, as we get into the other reaches because uh, you know as well being in the Okanagan the land is extremely limited so people are pushing into tougher and tougher locations and uh, you know soils that are leaner soils that are heavier like just less and less suitable areas and like who knows what that's going to be going forward but uh, you know for us if we look at what we've got for SO4 in the ground uh, the quality of wine that's getting produced off of that is just fine and uh, you know we can pick from our better blocks to produce our really high-end wine and do that and uh, so I think there's probably if you've already got it in the ground there's no reason to pull it out um, I still don't think like for me uh, going forward on my selection of uh, uh, rootstocks that I'm, I'm looking to plant, I still don't really have a place for SO4 in my in my repertoire right now. But oh, there if you, you got go. it, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for that. So yeah, I think we'll have to, out of respect for the time for our panelists and our um, participants as well, I think we'll, we'll call it there. 
Um, thanks very much, Mike, Andy, Jim, and Bill. That was some some great answers there. And thank you to our participants. Some amazing questions coming in. Um, I apologize we didn't get to them all, but I'll hand back to Darian and she will tell you how you can get your questions answered after the webinar. Over to you, Darian. And I'm sorry that we had to cut our panel discussion short. I think the one thing that I've learned throughout hosting all these webinars throughout uh, 2021 is that we need to make the sessions longer. So I think for next year, we will try to aim for maybe a two hour session or maybe multiple day sessions so that we can get all the information that everyone wants uh, out there. But for today and for 2021, uh, that concludes all of CGCN's webinars. So I want to especially thank our two presenters, Jim and Andy. Thank you so much for providing us with your presentations here today. And thank you to uh, Mike Watson and Bill Shank for um, sitting on our panel. And again, I'm sorry we had cut to cut the discussion short, but uh, I'm sure audience members uh, have many other questions that they would like to ask. And there were many questions still in the chat. So um, please note the contact information on my next slide. If you have uh, any questions that weren't addressed here today, I will try to do my best to address them via email. But join us again in early 2022 when CGCN will be hosting another series of webinars, starting with a one year later update on grapevine trunk diseases as our last webinar was on grapevine trunk diseases in um, young vineyards. So this future webinar, will we, be, we will be welcoming uh, back Jose Herbez Torres along with international speakers to discuss the current situation regarding uh, grapevine trunk diseases in Canada, pruning and uh, disease management in mature vineyards. So you can stay tuned to our social media and our website to be informed of all of these future events. And here is the contact information. So because as I mentioned earlier in the webinar, I will be returning back to school to complete my MBA we will be bringing in a new project manager uh, soon enough. So please send your questions if they weren't addressed to either of these addresses here, or feel free to call that number. And, and I will try to, my best to direct your questions to the appropriate contact. And with that, I conclude our presentation. So thank you so much. Oh, 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 before, before, before we go, Darian. Yep. On, on behalf of uh, CGCN and uh, Ross for, for hosting these events, I'd like to thank Darian for the time and energy that she's put into CGCN for the last period of time here. And so being a host of uh, these webinars and doing all the things that she does, we here at CGCN are very uh, proud of the work that she's been accomplishing in, in a short period of time that she's been here. And we wish her well as she continues down and, and completes her, her master's degree and that uh, master's of business. And so again, thank you Darian for, for all that you've done on behalf of CGCN. Oh, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure working with you and it's been a pleasure working with all of you here today and meeting you all. I hope you all have a great day then. That concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you again. Bye.